I will get started. It's at one. I hope everyone enjoyed the lunch. We certainly had a really much better turnout at lunchtime. Uh, <laughs> our first speaker is V Chu. Um, she is from Millipore Sigma, one of the vendor talks. Her uh, talk, is, uh, the title is Differentiation of Human IPSCs to Long Organoid. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is V Chu, and I head up the R&D that supports our cell culture and our workflow tool devices at Millipore Sigma. So um, first off, just want to thank the organizer for this um, opportunity to talk um, to everyone about um, you know, how, what we're doing in terms of um, IPS differentiation and really looking at how can we make more of a difference as, it, as we go more into 3D um, organoids. And so the title of my talk is called Human Lung Organoid Systems. And so just, you know, before I get started, I just want to kind of give you um, a summary of um, the respiratory system and how it develops. So if you can see here from the schematic that lung development starts from the time of gestation and it occurs um, really even after birth. And at the end of it, um, you have, you know, um, it's been approximated that a newborn has approximately 5 million alveoli by the time of birth. And so as you can see here, it's um, these alveoli and, you know, the lung, the reason for it is that it um, to allow for um, respiration and to allow um, for the exchange of um, the absorption of oxygen and then also the removal of carbon dioxide. And so there are five different stages of lung development, as you can show here. Um, oh, one second. Let's go back. Um, at, you know, at the very early embryonic stage, you have development of the tracheae, the major bronchii, and the diaphragm. Maybe it's better from here. Um, as you go and proceed through the pseudoglandular stage, you have development of the remaining conducting airways. And then at the canicular stage, you have development of the vascular beds, the capillaries, along with the um, bronchial and the alveolar ducts. And so as you can see, as you progress pr along lung development, you see a lot more complexity and you start to see highly complex branching structures being formed. Okay, once you reach the sacular stage, which is really the stage before, um, before birth, um, this is the stage where sacculars are formed. And these are the terminal structures that eventually develop into the alveoli. And so the sacular stage um, occurs approximately around the 26th week of gestation. And it's characterized by the maturation of the alveoli, along with the presence of these type two alveoli epithelial cells. And these cells are very important because they are responsible for the production of the surfactant. And the surfactant um, aids in reducing the surface tension at the air-liquid interface within the alveoli, and they prevents the alveoli from sticking together during exhalation. And so um, today's talk is really about how we can take human iPS cells, induced pluripotent cells, and differentiate them in a stepwise manner into these lung organoids that we believe really resemble um, the developing lung at the sacular stage. And it's at this stage that you start to see these very highly complex structures, which resemble the in vivo conducting airway. So you see these very complex branching structures, and then also these early gas exchange units with these alveoli structures. So as an overview, this is our human lung organoid system. You start off with um, induced pluripotent stem cells um, and through a stepwise differentiation protocol uh, that includes our chemically defined serum-free media kits. You go through a definitive endoderm stage, uh, anterior foregut endoderm, and eventually form these very highly mature lung organoids. And so, but this process is a lengthy process. And um, at each step, we do recommend very stringent quality control to ensure that you have a high purity and that your differentiation is efficient so that 
by days 40 to 60, you get these very nice complex structures, uh, branching structures that um, are reminiscent of the developing lung organoids. Um, our system has been validated on two human pluripotent induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, one that's derived from human foreskin fibroblast, and the other one that are derived from PBMCs derived iPS cells. Um, we show that um, the resulting lung organoids do express the appropriate markers indicative of multiple cell types that are found in the lung, and I'll show you that um, in later slides. And so some of the application for this type of, um, using this type of model is certainly for researchers that are interested in um, understanding more about lung development, um, respiratory research, and certainly in terms of uh, utilizing this as a model for um, infectious disease such as COVID-19. So to start off with, you know, I think one of the questions that we get a lot at Malapur Sigma is, you know, how can I be assured that I'm going to get uh, what I need at the end of my differentiation process? And I would say that one of the most critical things to do is that you've got to have a very good starting population of pluripotent stem cells. Now we start off, uh, we actually generate our own pluripotent stem, induced pluripotent stem cells through our um, uh, Simplicon RNA reprogramming. And this is a system that uh, where you take a synthetic self-replicating RNA that expresses the, the Yamanaka reprogramming factors, and you introduce that to um, the uh, somatic cells. Um, because it's synthetic and it's, it's an RNA, there are no DNA intermediates, and so therefore we can be assured that there is no genomic integration. So um, certainly we do it with our system, but if you have iPS cells um, already, you can certainly do that. Um, but it's also, it's very, very important that you start off with um, high quality um, pluripotent stem cells. And how can we be assured that we have uh, very good quality pluripotent cells is that um, we do very strict quality control. Um, we do flow analysis to assure that um, these um, iPS cells express all the pluripotent marker at very high percentages, at least greater than 95%. They have the correct morphology. And so you can see here that these are very nice uh, um, morphology of pluripotent stem cells. We also do karyotype analysis and genetic um, short tandem and repeat profiling to ensure that uh, the cells are, uh, are what they are and they have not been cross-contaminated with another line. And then also that they are uh, mycoplasma free. Now, whether you use our cell lines or you start off with your own pluripotent stem cell line, it's very important that you do, um, we do recommend that you follow a very strict quality control and ensure that um, before you start, that you have very good quality iPS cells and that, um, that they're not spontaneously differentiated. Um, once you have good quality iPS cells, once these cells um, are around 90% confluent, this is one um, you can then use our kit to differentiate them into definitive endoderm. And how you do this is that you dissociate your cells into single cells using rock I inhibitor, which increases the cell viability. Uh, and then using our media kits, um, you can simply add it to uh, plate it out and add it to um, your uh, six wall plate. And then um, by day four, this is when the quality control um, occurs. And at this day four, this is where you sacrifice one well and do a flow analysis to ensure that you have greater than 80% of your cell population um, express the correct definitive endoderm markers, in this case, CXCR4, CKIT, SOX17, and FOXA2. Okay. Um, once, um, you know, you can be assured that the cells express the correct marker, what we do say is that if for whatever reason, you do not get that um, high percentage of definitive endoderm marker. We do recommend that you start from the uh, start back to the pluripotent stem cell state, clean up your 
um, iPS cell culture it, to ensure that you get rid of any spontaneously differentiated culture um, and start over. Um, but what, let, assuming that you have the um, you know, high percentages of definitive endoderm markers, you're now ready to proceed to the next step. And it's at, uh, at this step that you dissociate your uh, definitive endoderm into single cells and then plate them uh, 1, million per well, uh, 1 million cells per well onto a fiber nectin coated six well plate. Um, shown here are some of the morphology of what you should expect. So this is at day four. This is right before you start the um, anterior foregut endoderm. And you can see that um, at this stage, the cells are fairly confluent monolayer. Once you apply the, um, the differentiation media over a period of uh, four days later, you start to see that the cells start to undergo these morphological changes and you start to see these um, small clustering of the cells. At day eight is also another quality control where um, we recommend that you sacrifice a well and do um, an immunocytochemical uh, staining for SOX2 and PAX9. And these are um, two markers uh, that are expressed in the anterior foregut endoderm. Um, your quality control at this point is that you should get greater than 95% of your cell population being positive for SOX2 and PAX9 by ICC. Now we've also uh, characterized these anterior foregut endoderm and show that along with being uh, mostly positive for SOX2 and PAX9, that around 20 to 30% of the cell population also expresses EPCAM and PAX9. Um, they also express uh, the endoderm marker FOXG1 and NKX2.1. Um, at this stage, it is possible to cryopreserve your anterior foregut endoderm cells for later use. Um, so um, if, if you don't want to proceed or if there's time limitation, it's very possible to freeze your cells at this stage. Now, after day eight, this is um, when you transfer your cell aggregates um, using a cell scraper, and you transfer it from one well of a six well plate uh, to one well of an ultra low attachment 24 well plate. You do this at a one to one ratio. So, in other words, one well to one well. As you can see here in these images, um, from one well, you, you, you have over 50 to almost 100 um, uh, lung bud organoids. And so you can see that it's quite a lot. And so that's just from one well. So if you wanted to um, generate more, it's just, just scale up in terms of the number of wells. Uh, these, are, these aggregates are grown as suspension cultures uh, in ultra low attachment plates. Uh, we do not recommend that you titrate this to single cells. It's very important at this stage that they grow as suspension cultures. Um, the media ex is exchanged every other day um, for several weeks, three to four weeks until days 20 to 25. Okay. And at this uh, stage, this is the lung bud organoid stage. This is days 20 to 25. It's flexible in terms of when you want to do this. Um, but essentially what you wanna do is um, under the microscope, you wanna select for organoids with the folded structures. Now it's these folded organoids with the folded structures that are the ones that are, are more prone to generating these branching structures, the more highly complex branching structures. So um, you wanna select these organoids and you wanna transfer six of these to make a matrix gel sandwich. And shown here is a schematic of how to make this matrix gel sandwich. I should say that all this is um, very detailed and presented um, uh, in our, our data sheet, which provides a step-by-step -step protocol for how to make these matrix gel sandwich. But just in summary, um, you take a 24 well plate, you coat it with matrix gel, you then uh, make a suspension culture where you're transferring four to six organoids um, in an equal volume of matrix gel and this maturation media. You allow, you overlay that onto the 24 well plate, allow the matrix gel to solidify, 
and then you overlay it with cold matrix gel and allow that to solidify. So it's this matrix gel sandwich that really helps mature uh, and um, allow for that branching um, morphology to occur. Shown here are um, just a time course of the different types of um, morphologies that can occur. And so you can see it's quite varied. So if you look at um, A here, this is at day 38, it starts out, there's quite a lot of branching, but then as you progressively go on, you can kind of see that it has really start to really mature and to form um, um, these very distal tips, okay, at day 74. Here's another morphology at day 38. You have these round balls and then it progressively mature. Um, now we've, what we've done is that we, if you puncture one of these round balls at day 60 or 70, what you'll see is that they, they will start to release this mucous substrate. Um, here's some more branching structure. So again, um, these are, are relatively mature lung organoids that are reminiscent of the satular stage. We validated this on two different types of iPS cells. Um, the, you know, as I've mentioned previously, from derived from human foreskin fibroblasts or from PBMCs. We've gone on to uh, further characterize these lung organoids and ask, do they express the correct um, cell types that one would expect at this stage. And so just to remind you at the satular stage um, that at this stage, you should see this alveoli type two cells, which secretes the surfactant. And um, we were very happy to see that um, at our day 70 um, organoids that they do express markers for the type two alveoli epithelial markers. And that's SFTPC and also SFTPB. They also express the airway goblet cell markers, mucin 5AC, the pulmonary endoderm marker, EPCAM, SOX9, and NKX 2.1. Um, uh, similarly, they also express um, markers for ciliated cells. So now I want to talk, you know, we've shown that you, we, we express the correct proteins. Now we actually want to go and ask, um, can we somehow show functionality um, of our mature lung organoids? And so here I wanted to introduce you to actually go back. Um, so it's, it's known that the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator or the CFTR, it's, it's an anion channel that's essential for normal fluid and electrolyte homeostasis at epithelial surfaces. This CFTR is expressed in multiple tissues, including the lung. And so as uh, most of you probably already know, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that are caused by mutations of the CFTR um, gene, and the most common mutation being um, a... Um, deletion at the phenylalanine at residue 508. And these mutations disrupt the function of the chloride channel, which causes a thick layer of mucus to form. Now, there, you know, more recently within the past couple of years, um, it's, there's, it's been shown that you can actually assess for um, the presence of CFT or the function of the CFTR um, channel using a forskolin-induced swelling assay. And so this is a very rapid and quantitative assay. It's been used on gut organoids for drug screening for cystic fibrosis indication. And it's been shown that it's, it's a very precise and sensitive method to discriminate uh, for drug responses for personalized medicine. And how does this work? What you do is that um, you apply forskolin um, and that activates adenylene cyclase and increases intracellular cyclic AMP, um, and in, which then activates protein kinase A, and phos which then phosphorylate the CFTR channel. The phosphorylation of the CFTR channel opens up the channel and allows the influx of the uh, of the anion and water to come into the organoids. And as a result, 
the organoids will swell as a result. This happens at a very quick time frame, and it's a very quick and easy uh, way to assess um, whether or not you have a functional CFTR channel. So we utilize this assay um, to look to see whether or not our IPS-derived lung organoids were also had functional channels. Um, now, I should remind you that our IPS cells are derived from normal fibroblasts, and so the resulting lung organoids are, are, are normal. So therefore, they should have normal CFTR function. And so what we did here is that we took day 49 lung organoids, and it's at, at this time that you really start to see the very highly complex branching structures of the lung. Um, and what we did is that we applied um, 10 and 20 micromolar of forskolin um, over a course of 24 hours and 48 hours and monitor whether or not we see the swelling that's indicative of a functional CFTR channel. And what I've shown here in these images, if you look at the red arrows that um, at, at time zero, um, this is what the organoids look like. Um, and then starting at day 24, you start to see swelling and then increased swelling at the 48 time, time frame. So you see this in multiple examples here. Um, in contrast, in the untreated control, um, you see that there is um, no swelling. Um, okay. So th this indicates that we do have um, a, a functional CFTR channel and that they do behave as expected. What we also wanted to do now is to take a look and to make sure that it was CFTR um, dependent and specific. So for this assay, what we did is that we took two known chemical inhibitor of CFTR. In this case, it's CFTR inhibitor minus 172 and uh, GLH101. These are two well-known chemical inhibitor that are selective for the CFTR channel. Um, in this uh, image up here, this is our control where um, it's um, where we just added in 20 micromolar of forskolin and monitor it over a period of 48 hours. And so um, as expected, we see that after 48 hours, you see the significant swelling of the organoids um, in response to the um, forskolin. However, if we now add in uh, these inhibitors, um, what you see is that this really now has um, completely inhibited the swelling. Um, and so we can be assured that this um, is specific to and dependent on the CFTR channels. Now, I've mentioned previously that uh, these lung organoids might have be a, a model for um, infectious disease. Uh, and so what we did here is that we took a look and asked, are the receptors in um, other enzymes that enhances the SARS-CoV-2, are they expressed in our lung system? And so we took um, highly mature lung organoids and stained them for the ACE2, which is a SARS-CoV-2 binding receptor. And then we also stain it for TMPRSS2. This is an enzyme that enhances the SARS-CoV-2 viral entry. And what you see here is that uh, our lung organoids do highly express the, um, the, these proteins that are important for um, the viral entry suggesting that they, they have uh, implications for um, as a model system for if you're looking at infectious disease. So to kind of summarize, just wanna make sure that I, within the timetable, um, sorry. So to summarize, um, I've shown you that, you know, we have this um, lung organoid system um, that can be generated from pluripotent iPS cells. It's a stepwise differentiation protocol that comes with our chemically defined and serum-free media kits. Um, we show that following this protocol, and again, uh, the protocol provides very detailed um, steps along with um, QC 
criteria and recommendations to assure success. Um, at the end of that, you should have highly complex structures that resemble the in vivo conducting airways um, and early gas exchange units. Uh, we show that um, key markers such as SFTB, uh, PB and SFTBC are expressed at the protein levels, suggesting that these are lung organoids resemble the more mature stages in fetal lung development. Um, we also show that the uh, CFTR gene and channel is functional um, and that the, our lung organoids do express the two SARS-CoV-2 cell entry markers, ACE2 and TMPRS2. And so um, just want to say that all of this work was done by a very talented scientist in, in, in my team, Dr. Min Lu, uh, shown here. Um, she's now since gone on to another company, but um, a lot of fantastic work done um, by her. I don't know whether I still have time. Uh, time. Okay. All right. Um, and with that, I'll, ask, I'll uh, stop here and answer any questions. Any questions for Dr. Chu? Um, I have a quick question about your reprogramming uh, mm -hmm. that uh, Simplicon. Since it's a self-replicating RNA, how long does the RNA stay in the cells? How long does it stay? It, um, I would say that it should be cleared by the second passage. Oh, yeah. Um, what is the reprogramming efficiency? Reprogramming efficiency is pretty good. I, I, I forget what it is. It's in our, it's on our website. We uh, increase the efficiency and it's also detailed in our protocol by the addition of ad additional um, small molecules to kind of help. So it's at least comparable to Sendai? I think it's at least comparable to Sendai. Yes, okay. absolutely. Cool. 